cool. Hi everyone, it's Jason Lowe from Oracle here. We've got a fantastic workshop uh, tonight and I am very much welcome to present Saurabh, one of our Oracle aces. How are you Saurabh? I'm doing good Jason, how are you? Good, good. So um, we can talk about, we'll get through into who you are in terms of the topic um, tonight. Um, so let's just get straight into it. Um, so tell me about yourself in terms of your relationship with, uh, with data insights and storytelling. Well, Jason, uh, my connects, my relationship with insights and storytelling uh, go a long way around 15 years back when I was sort of a naive in the technology industry and I started off as a psychologist and as a practitioner, and I used to assess a group of people, a community of uh, folks aspiring for Indian Defense Forces. Um, I used to assess uh, and generate insights around their behavioral aspects, their communication. So that's where, that's my very old memories of what the insights are. And based on that, we would do the thematic perception around the objects around and use them for storytelling purposes. Now, uh, jumping into the industry, I found uh, that insights have got a different value when it connects to the business and the impacts it creates. Uh, and having worked with Oracle for quite a long time and uh, working with their database product management, I saw the other side of the insights that what is the tooling required to generate those insights. When I ventured into the AI world with the analytics at GE, uh, then the analytics and the insights were much more business focused. And if you name it a business line like supply chain, finance, purchasing, the insights were the core of all these uh, subject areas. Now, what essentially are the insights are? We combine different data sets, okay? We look into, we peep into the different data worlds and come with a very summarized version of uh, common uh, commonalities across all these ecosystem and we come up with an actionable insights that can give us a clue how do we perceive a certain uh, event how do we perceive certain action and those are the golden nuggets which make us more intelligence and when we repeatedly build a system around this intelligence we call it as as an ai system but end of the day what comes out from these systems are those insights that help us to be more you know, intelligence, more, more, uh, you know, decision provoking and uh, help us to be smarter in the way we work. So that's about, you know, my connects with the insights are and uh, plain insights do not make a lot of sense, right? Mm -hmm. So, and with, with all these insights, we need to curate a story. Uh, so that builds a business case and that, uh, you know, advocates the existence of these insights. So what, in my sense, insights and storytelling go hand in hand. If I just have the insights, it's a very static intelligence, which I get. But the moment I curate a story around these insights, that holds a lot of value. That becomes a sort of a standardized percep per per what to say, perception for everyone. Yep. So, uh, so in the next few days, we are going to be a uh, whole bunch of teams and people going to be in this hackathon. And there's going to be a mad rush in terms of storytelling, understanding the problems and delivering solutions and a pitch at the end. So what do you think in terms of maybe a couple of tools that you could recommend to others in this space to, to demonstrate those insights to help that storytelling? Sure. So uh, at a very ground level, let's think about what do we need to generate insights and uh, what tools do we need to do a proper, say, a very standardized level of uh, storytelling? We need a storage, right? Yeah. We need a toolkit to generate insights. We need a toolkit to transform the data. And we need to a tool, a platform product to render that storytelling in terms of the fancy visuals and uh, very easy to understand and something that catches our eye straight away and we can make out the difference. What is this? What is black versus white versus big versus small? We should be able to make out. So these are essentially four things well, that we need. Now coming from you know the data world, my experience says that yes, we need a cloud storage, a massive storage because you cannot generate insights with a small amount of data. 
uh, we don't know we don't want to get into the issues of say discussions around the overfitting and underfitting in this case <laughs> so we need to this volumes of data so of course we need a cloud storage yeah. and then we need a data transformation tools like uh, uh, when we talk about python we have numpy pandas which are more like a data engineering and uh, data transformational uh, uh, libraries and then we need uh, machine learning libraries like tensorflow and uh, xgboost and you know the awareness around different algorithms regression classification clustering now combining all these engineering ar around all these components is is what builds an ai system and the end goal of uh, and output of this ai system are the a bunch of insights that have to be rendered on a tool like uh, oracle visualization or uh, if you are if I, if i'm too much like a researcher then i would be happy with the plotly and matplotlib and i would be happy doing on my console a little uh, shiny graph and seeing that okay how the trends look like but if yeah. i'm producing a tool then and a dashboard then i need a, a sophisticated or enterprise version edition to uh, paint these insights in a better in a readable way yeah so we've, we've, think, uh, we've seen we've seen in a couple of the other uh, hackathons that people have tended to go towards yes uh, Jupiter and Matplotlib, yeah. uh, but then there's other things in terms of data science cloud that people got into using uh, with the auto L and the explain features, but also dovetailing back into analytics cloud, as you're saying before with visualization, just to, because they ran out of time. It, it, it's just, just having all these tools that seem to be um, um, yeah. in that short period of time was very valuable. And the other thing, Jason, I would add is uh, uh, we all can be very good with the open source toolkits and, uh, uh, you know, having a Python edition on my laptop, I can do the things, I can pull the data, given the capacity of my laptop, I can process it, I can uh, generate the static insights. But if you see the trend, industrial trends, the way the world is moving is more towards healthier AI, a much more responsible and the ethical AI. And the way we produce healthy AI is through the operationalization of end-to-end -end AI systems. Okay, so my data connection should be seamless. I should have sufficient data storage. And then the ML operations or so the machine learning model execution should have sufficient processing power, right? Which is not very much, uh, I'll be always constrained by the processing of my Mac here. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I need, uh, a, a very superlative sort of uh, platform where I need to produce these ins insights and paint a dashboard. So I think uh, when I look at the Oracle Analytics Cloud, there are multiple features available. You have the cloud infrastructure, you have the seamless connectivity to not just to Oracle platforms, but to disparate uh, source system as well. If you are in AWS, if you are in Azure, if you have the flat file systems, if you have Oracle databases, you, you can connect and you can bring the data onto the Oracle cloud infrastructure. The other thing is the native support to, uh, you know, to different scripting languages, right? You have R, you have Python. So you have Oracle ML for R, you have Oracle ML for Python. And then the beauty is that if I am comfortable writing my data extractions in um, SQL, you even have Oracle ML for SQL, right? So I don't have to be probably a very biggie expert on Python and R to start using the Oracle machine learning. You can do it with SQL as well. And then you need that environment, you need an IDE. So you have the Jupyter notebooks, even you have the Zeppelin notebooks as well. So that again, you can use and uh, uh, Oracle ML for Spark, for processing, for even faster processing, parallel processing. And then uh, when you have the story, you have the insights ready, you use the Oracle visualization to, uh, to generate and to have a dashboard with all these insights reflecting different trends, different indicators. So I think, uh, uh, you know, you have the end-to-end -end life cycle management of an AI and ML system using Oracle Cloud. The other aspect which is quite critical these days, and uh, I keep on telling my colleagues in my network that uh, the ML ops is very critical for the uh, health of uh, AI and ML systems. If you miss out on that part, probably AI and ML systems have the tendency to decay over time. Uh, so ML ops, uh, uh, you know, helps in maintaining the health of these uh, uh, systems, AI systems, and 
you know, how to manage and monitor and keep a check on the fairness and privacy of the systems. So this is where I think Oracle has done a great job in coming up with the MLOps uh, framework. Uh, you deploy, you industrialize your AI systems, but still you get the flexibility of managing these uh, systems at scale. So I would recommend for the hackathon participants to have a look and we'll have a link uh, shared alongside where you can have a live session. You can, you can go through a lab and get to know that how to use these different components together to build in healthy AIML systems. Yeah, so we can share that those things at the end. And as part of this event, we're offering the, the pro, promotional uh, environments um, around Oracle Cloud. So people can actually get in there and use these live labs within that tenancy. So uh, we, 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 we're giving those things to all the participants as part of this event. So that's definitely something that's there. And, and it may not necessarily be the operational side, but the operational side also comes into the speed of, of agility as well. So because you're not necessarily need to manage that, um, then it's typically faster. There's tooling, there's provisioning uh, that, that's also done for you, which means that your time to execute is also reduced as well. So that's, that's fantastic when you're looking at that. So, um, one thing I do want to draw out a little bit more is you may uh, around that the healthiness um, couple couple of terms that come to mind is explainability, security, privacy, things those kind of things that that came up. So how do you think we should approach that when we are um, looking at the data and the insights to make sure that it it is proper and and healthy in that respect? Sure. So uh, if you look at the numbers which are published by the top uh, analyst, uh, uh, you know, agencies like Gartner and Forrester, there are only 18 to 20% of the AI systems which see their life in production. Okay. And the reason is we research a lot on AI. We research a lot on uh, the different application areas of artificial intelligence. Uh, and there are two reasons why Many of the research fail to move to production. Number one, we do not have the MLOps strategies. And number two is uh, the people, the end stakeholders, the beneficiaries of AI systems fail to understand that, how to understand this black box. Okay, it's an intelligent system. It is augmenting my intelligence, but I don't know how to, uh, it's a black box for me. So that has caused uh, the birth of the debate around the explainability of AI systems. Right? How, how far or say how much this AI system is explainable, the rules which internally this box has built in, uh, can I interpret it as a human or not? Okay, so very often you would see these uh, uh, news coming in that there were two bots talking to each other in some language which no one can understand. <laughs> At the end of the day, you just go and switch off the system and say, shut up, I'm going to rule you again. So uh, this is what the essence of explainability is. If we are building AI systems, which uh, you know, we are just waiting for the predictor to come out and say that, who this is, I give you an apple and you're telling me an orange uh, because you learned that system is, this is of fruits, this is a bucket of fruits, right? So I think that that's the, uh, uh, that, that's gaining a lot of traction. And uh, mm -hmm. even there are open source libraries which help you in uh, explaining the relevancy of the features on which this AI and ML systems are built. Uh, and then there are other ways uh, to detect the fairness of an AI system. So it runs a lot of experiments and uh, Oracle provides that flexibility of running that experiments at scale and picking, picking up the best one, which has the best, uh, uh, you know, the importance of these features which are detected. Yeah. So. Uh, the explainability is uh, the other aspect of explainability. If we are putting an AI ML systems in our business critical environments like financial, which it requires, which has the financial uh, gains and financial uh, intricacies associated with it, it's important that we measure the, the factor of explainability, the interpretability of the AI systems and how fair they are. Uh, do they perform consistent in all the situations or not? And uh, that also connects back to the threat into the security and privacy because right now you have so many, uh, you know, vulnerability areas where you can poison the training and poison the learning and the intelligence of the AI system. So that has to go 
that treated with a little cautiousness at how, what is the level of exposition you are going to bring in to the AI systems which we are using. Uh, and, and yes, that, that puts a governance and the compliance layer in front of it before it gets into the consumption side. Yeah, I, I think just to ask a second, a secondary question on top of that, at this event where we've got, where we are looking at different challenges as part of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, where we are looking at health, well-being, education, and also decent work and economic growth. There is all of a, a human element in terms of fairness and um, doing the right thing, um, especially when we, especially across all those three. So, how do you see the the importance of explainability to make sure that we're doing the right thing for the people that we're actually helping in these cases? That's a great point. That's a great point, and. Uh... Uh, you know, believe me, the explainability only relaxes the humans that, okay, these machines are not yet uh, overpowered their intelligence. And that gives us subtle happiness that, yes, uh, we know that how these machines are working on. So, yeah, um, uh, coming to the point, uh, the explainability of AI systems play a lot of uh, a bigger role in uh, giving the confidence to us, the humans, uh, in putting these systems into the mission critical scenarios, uh, business critical scenarios, where there's a lot of things on stake and we know that where the human intervention is required and how long the machine's interventions can sustain the business. So um, if, we, if I take a, take a step back, which is around 10 years back, uh, the entire industry was very enthusiastic in adopting the AI ML systems, okay, mm -hmm. AI ML technologies because the perception was that they're reducing the human errors and they're bringing a level, level of automation. So whatever they do, we were happy with it. But over the time when people, when the industry started realizing that, okay, we in, 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 the, in the back scene of automation, we are actually uh, putting an intelligence which we are not confident on. So that generated the need of whole explainability. And now I think we are much more smarter mm -hmm. in terms of driving the difference between uh, how long, what I just mentioned, that how long the intelligence, machine intelligence can take decisions and where we need to put a level of governance uh, and uh, have a human intervention. So I think the, the if you take a look and I, I'm going to share a very uh, nice uh, white paper, which I was going through uh, a few days back from Oracle. I'm going to share that link. Uh, Fantastic. Uh, Thank and, you. And that, will, and that will reflect uh, the the how the large enterprises who are so cautious about the adoption and the trends of AI in the industry, like Oracle does, and uh, they are are uh, you know sending out a strong message that if we use the level of you know the toolkits which are provided by the large enterprises, uh, what is that level of uh, fairness and interpretability that we need to keep in mind before we move this uh, AI systems to production environments. Yeah, so I think as a as an outcome for anyone that is looking to do, especially in this hackathon here, that um, yes, you may have a model, you may go through and, and train a model or um, with some outcomes and some insights, but I think as part of this one here, it's probably as critical that they put some effort into that explainability to demonstrate um, how that question is answered uh, and what are those insights are based on as part of what they pitch as part of part of the hackathon. I think that's yeah. probably going to be as, as important as, as the end result. Right, uh, right, Jason, yes. Um, so, as part, so, so one, one of the things I'll, I'll just probably end off here um, is, um, yeah, We'll, we'll definitely share a couple of those, uh, some links as part of what we talked about and referred to. You mentioned before uh, there was a, a, a workshop, uh, a live lab workshop um, that people could actually uh, get in there and try. Um, and just to explain to everyone, live labs is uh, pretty much uh, a massive cat uh, catalog of all these different learning experiences that we've got. Uh, some of them you can actually run within our cloud. Some of them, they can be run within these uh, promotional trials that we're giving out to everyone at the hackathon. Um, and they're, 
they're really short. Most of them are, are within 30 minutes, 60 minutes in terms of the length. Um, so really interesting, really simple to actually just get started to learn uh, around this. So I appreciate you bringing, bringing that uh, to our attention and to everyone that's, that's joining, joining the World Innovation Day Hackathon. Appreciate your time, Sarab. Thanks, Susan. Thanks for having me here. And I wish uh, everyone all the best in the hackathon. And uh, make sure, so one of the you know, the beautiful point you brought up, Jason, was uh, the live labs and workshop. And that will give you the extent of how these components interact and talk to each other uh, while achieving bigger milestones. So I, I feel the, lit the literacy part is also equally important. We all understand uh, going through the documentation and we have that habit. We come from that world of getting into the brochures and product documentations to have a look at how these uh, systems work. Uh, but at the same time, I think what Oracle has done, uh, uh, you know, quite uh, stupendously is uh, coming up with this live labs and, uh, you know, the overview sessions and they give you a beautiful recorded view of how these uh, things work and you can try something on all by yourself uh, and, uh, you know, uh, limiting yourself and restricting yourself to the Oracle infrastructure. So I think, yeah, that gives a hands-off view on yeah. how these components work. Yeah, so we'll share that. And um, more recently, within like the last couple of weeks, we've had the Oracle Dev Live uh, webinar series, virtual webinar series. So um, mm -hmm. I'll probably share a couple of those things as well because there's been some really good AI uh, machine okay. learning uh, sessions as part of that. So, um, so I thank you for your time this, uh, tonight and this afternoon from where you are. Um, so I pre appreciate you joining with us. Thank you, Jason. Okay, thanks very much.